this is it. We're doing a boat tour. Well, this will be the second boat tour of sorts, really. Yeah, that's right. We did do a quick boat tour before we did the refit, before Maroo looked like this um, in Tasmania <laughs> a year ago. So you can check that out if you want. Um, I put the link on the screen and in the description of the video. Maroo looked pretty rough. Um, I bought it before I met Pascal and trust me, it was just a single fella boat. We flogged Maroo pretty much around Australia on a really super tight budget. Yeah. Um, and the refit was a long time coming. We had to do the refit and we had to do an extensive refit because we were crossing um, the, the Great Australian Bight. So we had to insure our lives a little bit by making sure the boat was totally seaworthy, which we did. That's right. We lived with the boat the way it was for three years. And so we got some really great ideas those three years about how we wanted to modify the interior. So this video is going to focus on the interior and we'll bring you a video on the deck mm. later on. Oh, I would recommend totally people, if they bought a new boat, is to live with it a little while just so you know what you, you want out of a boat. And, and we are really happy. The refit that we did, everything's, well, it's quite neat and orderly. It's seaworthy, but it's, it's easy to maintain, but it looks homely. Yeah, smart, but unsophisticated. Nice. <laughs> like us. Yeah. Um, through the video, we'll be referring to projects that we tackled in the refit. Yeah, so what I'll do is I'll organise um, the elements of, that we talk about inside the boat into chapters, and then there'll be uh, a link in the description. There'll be links to various other videos that might look into those projects in more detail. So yeah, if we're talking about uh, the electricals or anything like that, mm. just um, just remember and in the description of the video, we'll have a little timestamp and we'll have a link to the video. So if you were, oh, I'd like to know more about that electrical box, yeah. you can go off to the video. We just don't want to bore people if they've <laughs> watched it before. Yeah. Um, all right, should we kick it off? Yeah, let's kick it off. We'll start up in the V-Birth. <laughs> Let's go. Hey, this is the forecastle or our bedroom, and this is where we sleep. So let's take a closer look. In the original Clansman design, the water was up front in a water tank, which is what we originally had. But we've since shifted our water storage to under each bunk here in two separate 95 litre bladders. We keep all our clothes here and a little bit of overflow bedding. Um, it's just enough space for us. We don't need much while we're sailing. We're using the wide angle to capture the whole cabin space, and it makes it look quite big, but it's not that big. Because if I, it's not my arm span width. But up here where we sleep, it's quite wide. It's about king size width, and then down the end, it's a single width. So our feet are kind of tucked together, but we've got lots of space where our shoulders and our heads are when we're asleep. While Paskey's in the bedroom, we'll just talk about the airflow in a Klansman. It's really good. Um, it's a small boat, <laughs> so we don't really have to worry about air getting through. It actually gets pulled through the companionway by a Venturi effect that happens at the hatch there above Paskey's head. There's a little unique design for the Klansman. They've got a built-in Durad. So in bad weather, um, we can shut the hatch. That Venturi no longer uh, happens, but through the Durad, air is forced back through the boat. So we can have a quick look at that. The Durad is behind the fan and we've made the fan removable. Just move the fan out of the way and this is the Durad more clearly. When we uh, go sailing, we shut it up so that no water can get into our bedroom so that it's watertight. Behind me is the anchor locker and I'm going to get Troy to tell you a little bit more about that. The anchor locker in here is a little bit of a compromise. In an ideal world, this would just be a solid bulkhead and you would have a, like a floor above water level and then a chain locker and it would be self-draining. You wouldn't ever need to get into here. You'd just go straight from the top. But this one, previous owners have changed it so that they could have a mechanical anchor winch and we've, we've reinstalled another mechanical anchor winch and they need enough drop down here for it to work. This anchor locker now is not self-draining because the very bottom of it goes beneath water level. What that's meant is we need to manually pump it out if this fills up. The reason why we can't have this just as one big hatch where I can get in there to make cleaning easier and flaking down the chain is we still need it high enough above ocean level, which is down here somewhere, that in case of like a hole in the front, we don't necessarily get the boat flooded out. So we just have to have this little lid here. And with that, I'm able to inspect and service, lubricate the, um, the winch at the bottom here, have a look at the pump, and also we can reach in and flake the anchor chain or take care of any problems. So it's not an ideal world, and we did have some problems with some down flooding, but we have addressed that. We've made a little hood that goes on top of our anchor winch. That's got rid of a lot of the water that can come in. And now that we're back in civilization, it's an old trick um, of just molding up a bunch of plasticine. Some people were 
talking about a YouTuber that was doing it, but this goes way back to Montessier <laughs> using plasticine to fill up your hose pipe, so we can do that as well. Just under here, we also store a 20 litre drum full of methylated spirits to run our stove. We like methylated spirits because you don't need to have, with gas you always have to have gas certificates, you need safety um, precautions in place and also filling gas cylinders around the place isn't all that easy. Methylated spirits is very easy, you can just carry a jug of it around. Um, extra storage and we've also got a high density polyethylene 40 litre tank. So when our two 95 litre bladders are empty, if they ever become empty, if we go onto that tank, we know we've got 40 litres to go, but we also have a water maker that we're going to have a look at. You have the throne. Nothing too fancy, is it? Because hopefully we don't want to spend too much time here. <laughs> so we haven't, we haven't made it too elaborate. But one thing that we do want to talk about is we have a holding tank on our little boat. And a holding tank's really, really good if you want to obey the law in some areas, which we do. But also we have a water maker on board and you don't necessarily want to flush the toilet when you're making fresh water. And the other thing is, is sometimes, not often, but sometimes we'll have other people, you know, like um, having a boat around us or swimming in the water and stuff like that. So we don't want to flush any any raw sewerage into the, into the sea. There's places where you can and can't discharge the toilet on a boat and it's pretty clearly lined out. So when we're in those areas where you can't, we put it in our holding tank. This used to be just a shelf on the Klansman and this was all wasted space. So. I cut out and made a base and filled this all in. And now that's made us about a 38 litre tank. When you, when you flush this toilet, there's a switch here, it's an electric pump. We pull out the travel pin <laughs> and you can open the valve and then that's open to the sea. We can shut the valve once we're done and replace that pin. And that's just a nice safety feature. Like whenever someone's using the toilet, that valve is really easy to reach down there. So that that's just flushed then has gone up through this pipe really, really high and dumped from the top into that holding tank. This holding tank, the very bottom of it is like half an inch, one inch above sea level outside. So now that when this tank fills up, all we have to do when we do want to dump it, or if we want to isolate that tank so it becomes a tank, not just a straight through and out, there's a valve in the next locker and we can just shut that. Then when that tank fills up, we can just open it. There's no further pumps, apart from the pump that macerates or chews up the toilet paper and, and your number twos and shoots it into there, that's the only pump in the system. It doesn't need to be pumped out or anything else like that because it's just above water level, gravity takes care of it. We do have, this is still very much used as a shelf. We do have a half inch breather up here and that can be isolated. You know, that can be shut if we want to. There's not many, there's not many reasons to shut that. So that's generally left open. And if this tank ever fills up, because that's quite a large breather, you'll never have a problem where your blower fitting off or something nasty like that and fill the toilet up with, um, with waste. And that's, <laughs> There's some real design flaws out there I've seen where you can definitely blow fittings off holding tanks and just fill your boat up with unpleasantness. There is a provision here as well. There's a great big two inch tube where we can hook that up um, and we have when we're in the Clarence River. You can hook that up to a, a pump out facility and you can pump this out. So it doesn't need to be dumped. We found it very reliable. We've never ever had a problem with it, which is a good thing. One more thing before I pass it over to Paskey and talk about the pantry. When I was doing the refit, I wanted to put light in here um, and light for all three stages of the pantry here. And I just did it with a twin ganged light switch here. So we've got this one. And so we've got a really bright LED light that lights up the pantry. And also this bottom one that we can reach from inside at bed. We can turn that on and off. This is a this is a much warmer light than that cool work light. So when we're in here, it doesn't feel like that we're trapped under fluorescent lights. So this is uh, my pantry, or our pantry, I should say. Um, and we made these lee cloths up in Tasmania. We actually rebuilt the whole pantry. All the shelves were really rotten. The old ply was really rotten, so we ripped it all out and put new wooden shelves in and made these lee cloths out of some recycled sunbrella fabric from an old shade that we all had, but it was falling apart, so we 
the best bits of fabric we use to make these lee cloths and we find it works really really well. I can reach in and grab what I need most of the time but when I'm repacking and cleaning I can unhook um, the lee cloths and then pull everything out. Moving on to the galley space. This is <laughs> for the dish rack, so I might move this out of the way, it's not very pretty. So our two taps are a freshwater tap that we pump by hand and a saltwater tap that we use with a foot pump. What we did in Tasmania is we completely rebuilt um, this the storage space um, we put in sliding doors. The features of these doors, they're like standard sliding doors except they can't come out. That is a really good seaworthy feature because they can't pop out when we're in a seaway. So if we're bouncing around in the boat, they can't, can't fall out, they're locked in. We wanted somewhere to store our cutlery and stuff like that in a neat and tidy fashion. And I guess we just needed places to store little bits and pieces, but we couldn't really do that in a big locker like this. So we put in some little bamboo sliding drawers as well. If I open in here, I love this space because it's really big and I can get in and reach everything in here, which I couldn't do before. Before it was a little pigeonhole like that. And so you actually couldn't store anything big in there because the space was only small like that. So stacked here, which is really great. I have these long plastic containers. This is my newest, or one of my newest bits of kit. It's a thermal cooker. It's called a Shuttle Chef. Um, it slow cooks food um, and keeps food warm as well. So it's really great on passage. We can prepare something on the stove and then put it in here and eat it eight hours later and it's hot and delicious and you don't have to do anything. You don't have to have an open flame while you're underway. And it's just a great safety feature as well as a convenient thing on our boat. So behind here is more storage for food. I've got this big stainless pot that we don't use in the galley, but we have, we do use it when we go ashore and have fires. If we're gonna cook up like a big batch of mussels, you would have seen us using it a bit in the Kimberley and up in the Northern Territory. This is our utensil straw. So everything that I need to cook when I'm cooking at the stove and underneath it is more storage. Stuff that we don't use very often, but some things that we need to know where it is in a hurry, like Ooh, bungs. Every through hull has one of those. Yeah, so we have all the bungs down here underneath, the, underneath that drawer. And in here is all our plumbing for the water maker and the sink. So I might hand you over to Troy to talk about that system. So we've got a couple of seacocks, one here and one here. I've, in an ideal world, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really want them. It's just that they already existed. If I had um, my preference, I would have one big sea chest, just one big hole in the boat <laughs> that I, in an emergency I could deal with and everything taken off that. But you've got to work with what you got. This one here is for our salt water pump for our sink. Obviously you don't want to use fresh water for everything, um, you know, like peeling potatoes and cleaning and rinsing and stuff like that. You know, we only get around with 180, 200 litres of water, so we don't, have a, we don't have any to waste at all. We only really use about 12 to, somewhere between 12 and 15 litres between us every day. You know, our water budget's pretty slim. This one in the back, that goes back to our water maker as well. As Pasky said, if these got snapped off or there was an otherwise a problem, we've got one of these little wooden bungs that you dive over the side and you jam up through the hull to block them off. Every single seacock on the boat has a corresponding bung that can be rammed in from the outside. And they're all under there. They never get moved. We always know exactly where they are. Now with our water, we try and avoid having electrical pumps as much as possible, particularly with the fresh water. I know they're available and some people ask us why we don't have them and you can definitely have pressurized water. But with a manual pump, you can't leave them on. All right, they can't drain your water unexpectedly and it keeps things from being too sophisticated. This drawer, that can't come out in the seaway and it's nothing sophisticated. All we did was make a wedge of timber that's just the right distance that it just catches on there. <laughs> Nothing to it. It just falls down. Pull that there. This space under here, this is where in normal times we just stow our wet weather gear. So under there is a bit of an unsavoury area. We always wash and, and sort of air out our gear and make sure it's dry before it goes under there, but that's where it goes when we're not passage making. People often say they don't realise just how small the boat is when they come down and see it at marinas and things like that. You can just sit there at home and spread your arms out. We can touch. <laughs> 
both sides of it. Well, I can anyway. I'm six foot two. That's that, the widest part of the boat too, where this, you are now. Yeah, this is the widest part. Obviously, the the actual hull is there, you know? Like, it comes out another foot. So it's eight foot wide, all right? 2.4 meters. But certainly these windows, I can easily touch that. That's how, that's how little this boat is. I just decided that I'd go crazy on our tea cupboard and make it really organized. And it's really great because we drink like three or four cups of tea a day. Um, normally black tea in the morning and then herbal teas in the afternoon and the evening. So we have all different varieties in here, um, in different plastic containers. And then on this side, we've got Troy's coffee, coffee machine and coffee. And then we've got our nice stainless teapot. Um, yeah, and honey and things like that, that we put in our, in our tea. So I love this. Um, tea cupboard. Below my favourite cupboard is the workbench. We can put it away while I'm cooking like this. So we just put some bungee elastic on some um, eyelets under here and that just holds it like that. If we're in, um, if we're bumping around a little bit in a seaway it's not very safe to put it here like we found that it can fall away so we can also just take this workbench off and just stow it anywhere around the boat. It's flat, so it fits really well under the quarter berth and in various other places around the boat. This is our little spirit stove. It runs on denatured alcohol or methylated spirits, as we call it in Australia. It's a bit of an antique now. It's I think it's a 1990-something stove, so it's at least 25 years old. And we're really grateful to all of you that have sent us bits and pieces over the last few years so that we can keep it running. Some of the features of this stove that we really like, um, it has rails here so you can put fiddles on. This secures your kettle or your saucepan while you're underway in a seaway. Ta-da! Kettle secured. So it has a gimbal feature as well. So if we're underway, if we're on a really big hill, we can get even more room for the stove to swing by pulling out this drop board. Sometimes we are on a lean this much, believe it or not, and the stove is like that when I'm trying to make a cup of tea. I believe it. <laughs> so yeah, it's really great. We've got full swing room. Before we didn't have that and the stove used to bang, 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 bang. It was horrible. So now that this drop board's out, um, we'll show you what's behind there. After such a lovely segue from Pasky, <laughs> we'll just have a look what's behind this stove. I'll, I'll just I'll just pop it out. Give me Ooh. a second while I drop. Lose bits. Drop everything. What is going on behind there? What is going on behind there indeed? Apart from my beautiful spices. Yeah. Spice cupboard below the stove. Yep. So in behind here, this is the installation for our water maker. So you've got salt water feed in, reject water going out, and where it goes out is out of our sink. I plumbed it into the, <laughs> into the drain that goes out of the sink, and that just saved us cutting yet another hole in the boat. Um, and there's a little tube going off. That's the freshwater product water. It makes about four litres an hour and it uses one amp for every litre it makes. So it's not super efficient, but um, for, for our needs, it, it, it fills it out pretty well. It's only a small unit and this wasted space is not wasted anymore. So drop boards go back in. And when we made that, we just, we just gave that a bit of a thickness. It looks better but also Pasky's little um, bench can go on there. While we're on the subject of drop boards, we also found that a really good way of just isolating this so it didn't come flying out was to put these little drop boards as well. Obviously when the stove's in place and locked in, nothing can fly out of there. Um, and these little things also mean that you've got full access, so it makes it really easy to clean. But they are an incredibly easy way to secure a space and we use them pretty extensively over on this side of the boat as well and I'll show you why we use them there. Um, okay, so drop... You make it look like you've come from so far away. <laughs> <laughs> I just have come all the way from the other side of the boat. Um, so again, if you didn't watch the refit series, we use drop boards on this side as well. You can see that we had these just highly irregular um, crazy different size holes that we had to fill in. And so by putting, so just by putting these groove bits of wood and painting them so they just sort of blended away and, and epoxied them in, like they're, they're pretty well blended, we were able to use drop boards for that as well. And they've proven themselves to be just a super seaworthy thing. Like when we crossed, um, when we crossed the bight, you know, we had some massive seas, nothing showed any sign of shifting whatsoever. We think they look kind of sharp. 
So again, drop boards the way we made them like that. You know, you can just put your finger under there and lift them. Really good airflow. We've never seen a sign of mold in there. They're, we're really, really happy with them. I think they, they work really well. We can see there's a little bit of gray foam just on the underside of where our decks are exposed. We sometimes used to get a little bit of condensation. Ever since we put this foam in here, that's completely eliminated it. We don't have it in the rest of our living space, even though there's no liners on a Klansman. It's just, just bare fiberglass. When we did the refit, we painted this with a satin finish exterior house paint. Having the matte finish, it sort of hides all of the raw finish of a Klansman. They were built them kind of rough back in the day. And the other thing is we make videos. So we don't want little pinpoints of shiny light everywhere. We want a nice uniform flat white. Here in front of the fridge, we've got a jerry can and you might be like, that's not a very efficient use of space. I would put that into a tank. What we do is when we're using the water maker, Beside the fridge here, we have a little tube coming from the water maker and we fill up jerry cans with that. And the reason we do it that way, rather than, it would be a simple matter just to plumb these into, into a tank or something like that or into our bladders. But the reason we do this is some, somewhere along the line, if that water maker ever failed and contaminated this with salt water, we wouldn't want to lose everything, okay? So what we can do now is we can put it into here and we can either use it straight away because it's got a tap, or if we make too much, we can always transfer it into the bladders after tasting it and making sure after a test that it's okay. Because contaminating your water supply when you're a few weeks sail away from anywhere is sort of a bad thing to do. The table itself, we wanted to use that to uh, get additional storage. So we made this drop board. Okay, there's stuff in there. What that's meant is that this table is a little bit heavy. We don't always have this as a table and a settee. Sometimes we want to make this as a bed when we're cruising. And the way that we've done it is, we've, I wanted to do it so that just one of us could actually handle it to, to, to lower that down. So this leg here is part of our strategy. It carries a bit of weight. So you're able to lift the brackets off and then just put that down like that. And this can, this can be done under sail, by the way. And then we just undo a wing nut, give that a bit of a jiggle, drop the washer. Let's hang on to that for a second. And then you just take it out of its bracket and let this down. And then there's, there's a couple of little clips that I've put there as cupboard catches. So this can now not slide out when we're crashing around. Now the bits to make it all possible, we wanted to do it so it was a little bit cheaper, um, but also I wanted to use really common materials. So if, if there was any damage, you could just go into any local hardware and just get replacements. So I just use these just common and garden multi brackets. And what they do is they fit, when we've got it up as a table, they fit onto these 10, 10 gauge screws over here. Um, and rest on there. And then these little brass tongues, these are actually marine cupboard catches, so they've got a very nice strong spring and a ball bearing to hold them in there. And then this leg is actually held by a, a big gate hinge. When we've got wherever we want, and we don't want to have either a lounge or a bed, because it can be either, I just secure that with the wing nut. I don't put that really tight. And then it can be lifted and because you're pivoting off that arm, you don't really feel the weight of all the stuff. And then those brackets, they fit really positively on there. And you know, like you can definitely fall against that table. It's really, really secure. So our boat runs on 12 volt, but we have this inverter, 1000 watt inverter that can convert to 240 so that we can charge things like our drone batteries that are currently charging or our or our MacBooks that make videos. Our MacBooks, or, or well, one MacBook, mobile phones, uh, navigation tablet, all this stuff um, we charge through our inverter. I made these bags when we were in Tasmania, and it just uses all up all this space that was kind of empty space on the boat. This is really great. Um, this is stuff that we can grab easily. Um, we have like GoPro mounts and things like that. This is a bag full of cables for charging all of our devices. Just grab it and charge straight away. This is a bug screen um, that what we slot into our companion way hatch if we want some privacy and also to block out the light. So I'm going to pop that in now. Privacy screen, bug screen, blocking out the light. Massively overexposed background screen. Yeah. <laughs> that worked well. 
Um, behind here, in front of the fishing rod, we're a bit limited on space, so things like the fishing rod get stored on our um, hand grab rails. But behind this is our electrical cabinet. We had a really ugly cabinet before, and I asked Troy to see if he could hide it, make it magically disappear, and he did. He built these beautiful cabinets. And now, our electrics are very tidy. <laughs> and behind you can see the actual wiring. This is our angle fridge. It's pretty much, it's just a camping fridge. 12, it can run on 12 or 240, we run it on 12 volt. Um, it's 40 litres. The only real addition we've made to it is um, putting this rubber mat on it so we can put hot things on there when we're cooking. Um, it won't die. We've replaced the lid on it, we've replaced the baskets, but it just keeps running. Um, it's a little bit rusty, but what are you going to do? <laughs> it's on its second paint job. It's on its third paint job, I thought. <laughs> In here is um, a quarter of space that we use for storage. We've got like sails in there, um, heat beads for our barbecue, water catcher. When we're underway, we store our jerry cans in here. This is a blue grab tub um, that we can grab in emergencies that has flares and things like that and first aid and bits, like, bits and pieces. This kind of is fluid and moves around depending on what we're using and what we need at the time. Under here is our engine space and it's probably the most unsavoury part of the boat of all because the engine is... Oh man, how old is it? I think I've, it was early 90s. Yeah, the engine itself, it doesn't look that great from the outside because it's had a hard old life. But when I did pull it apart, the inside looked pretty good. Um, and I didn't want to repaint it or anything else like that because unless you get everything spotlessly clean um, and do a really good job, that paint can flake off and later block up your bilge pump. So I've accepted that the engine's going to look a bit scabby and I also accept that the engine space looks a bit scabby as well because sooner or later in the next decade this will probably be repowered this boat and some people say well why don't you go to an electrical propulsion or something like that in the in the thoughts that perhaps that that's a more green choice but really the way that we think about it the, the the best thing that we can really do is just keep this engine running for as long as possible because everything's been pulled out of the ground <laughs> it's gone into making it and our fuel bill is 200 litres a year you know I don't know what um, what what your fuel bill is but you know, 200 litres a year is not too bad. We've got this Raycor filter here. Pretty large, pretty high volume water separator um, and particle filter. It's, it filters down to about 10 micron um, for our refueling effort. So uh, under Paskey's feet, when she's in the galley, is 200 litres of diesel fuel. So we can, we can usually do about five and a bit knots when we're motor sailing. Um, so 200 litres, we've got about a thousand mile range if we're not sailing. To get the fuel up from the bottom, there's the, the problem with having fuel under the floor is that you can't have a drain to drain off the water. So I've got a little button here. It makes a horrible noise, but it draws that water up through the lines, through this separator, through the pump, and then up into a tank up here. So we've got 30 litres of fuel storage above the engine. It's really, really easy to prime the engine when I change filters or if there's an airlock or anything in the lines, I don't, have to, I don't have to pump it. Gravity will handle it. Also what's happened in the past is we had a, a hole in the diaphragm of the fuel pump and because I had the fuel up here, I was able to get rid of the fuel pump and as long as we didn't go over about 1800 RPM, just gravity was enough to supply my injector pump. In the other refit video, we talked about that I got rid of all the wiring harness for the engine to make things a lot less complicated and now we just have these um, these gauges on the front. Perfect gauges. Perfect gauges. With an alarm and it off just so I could talk to you but it's very rare that they are turned off. This step under here is one part of our battery storage. We have two 6 volt batteries in series here and that's paralleled with another two that are under this compartment back here. These batteries now were uh, five something years old, going pretty strong. They're doing pretty well in there. We do have a VHF radio that's just here, and you know you, we really need to be able to get to it quick. So there's no there's no real hiding it. I didn't want to make another cupboard for it. So we sort of live with that. But the back of our navigation gear, the the GPS that's outside, that's here. That it penetrates through to the inside of the boat. So I made one of these cabinets here and it gave me a chance to put another fuse block to handle all of our navigation gear. It also gave us a spot to put satellite communications, this Iridium Go, 
um, we can put that there. Our friend Pete gave us this little little transformer, little 12 volt transformer, so we're able to we're able to plug this in um, and charge it while it's in its in its little cradle. And our mate Rob from ClientSat, he he gave us a cable to run an antenna outside for this thing, so we don't need to take it out, put the little antenna up and, and have it out there. We can leave it always completely stowed in. So we've got the GPS back here. We've got our satellite communications. I've also taken a little bit of power, a little bit of 12 volt power, very, very low voltage off here and it runs to this switch. And that switch there um, puts power to a much stronger relay to our deck pump. So that's what that does. I also get to hide a few filters and stuff like this. So in, be in behind these little cupboards, is my little world but I've tried to make it as nice as possible a bit more of a housey look but we've still got all the essential ship systems and it works pretty well the other thing that's sort of ugly but necessary is safety next to the engine compartment a fire extinguisher next to an engine compartment it's a good spot and a bad spot to have a fire extinguisher it's a good spot because most of your fires happen either in the galley or in the engine compartment but it's a bad spot because if it's already on fire, it's hard to reach, and that's why we've got one in the pantry as well. So we can come through the front hatch, and there's another fire extinguisher just like this dry powder um, back there. We've got one of those there, and we've also got a fire blanket. When I was still a bachelor and I had the boat before Pascal, I had them on display. <laughs> but now we've got them sort of tucked away a bit more, but that doesn't, that, you know, it, it, it's no problem to get those. The other safety um, bit of equipment we've got here is our 406 EPIRB. And that, again, we were sort of um, weighing up where we could put this and can we stow it away and all the rest of it. In the end, we didn't want aesthetics to overrule safety, so we've got it here by the hatch, so it can be, it can be grabbed here, but if that engine compartment's on fire, um, we can also grab it through there and, and, and run away with it. Not necessarily um, safety of life, I guess, but some people say, oh, why has he got uh, earphones there? Mm. Obviously working on the engine, in an emergency, I want to be able to preserve my hearing. The other thing is, beside mine and Pasky's seat, is our life preservers. So these are just um, automatic inflation. They've got CO2 canisters in them. When we wear them, they're quite low profile, but they will inflate into a giant yellow thing. And also, um, we also have a video where it shows that there's a little transmitter in there that talks to our VHF radio. There's a little beacon and it will pinpoint with a GPS location exactly where that beacon is. So if someone falls off the boat and they've got their life preserver on, we'll be able to come back in this boat and actually find them. At the moment, this quarter berth is just holding all our soft furnishings because we're at anchor and we're just day sailing and hopping around. But when we go to sea and we go on long extended day passages, we set this up as a berth as, long as, as well as the settee. So we'll show you how it looks when we're on passage. This is our sleeping berth on the starboard tack. Very comfortable. If you heel it over like this, you can tuck yourself in. You can grab cushions and sort of make yourself comfortable, like so. Ready to tack? Changing into the other berth. So, yeah. so graceful. It's a bit hard to get into here, but once you're in, it's very comfortable. Oh, and you don't hit your head on the radio. You can just sort of mould your body into the side of the hull. Um, beautiful, nice cushion here made by our friend Steve. Got another handy storage bag in here. It's got like my silk lining and Troy silk lining, so you can hop into that if you're clean and get really cozy. And then obviously we've got the sleeping bags here. And you're just kind of locked in. I'm six foot two and the six foot headroom in a clansman. <laughs> I'm sort of used to it by now. A lot of the time when I'm walking through here, I'm actually like that going through. The old timey sailing boats, if you looked at them, the headroom, a lot of people had to be like that. So we're living in a, a golden age at the moment, but a lot of the time I have to s sort of spread my legs. Pasky gets through here pretty easily, but there are a few concessions that you still have to make as you know, a semi-tall fella in a little a little tiny boat. Well, that's it, gang. That's a, that's a look at the inside of Marul. Uh, all, of the, all of the hard work sort of paid off, didn't it? Yeah, thanks for staying with us for the whole video. I know it was a long one, but we had a lot that we wanted to show that we we're really excited about. Yeah, we've, we've tried to answer as many questions as we've tried to <laughs> yeah, field. Yeah. If you've enjoyed the videos, um, please let, let people know that, you know, that, that we're here. Yeah, there might be some inspiration. You might have friends with old boats that might get some inspiration or some ideas from our videos or from this tour. So please share it or let them know about it. Hmm. Hmm. 
and also um, liking it always helps and subscribing to our channel helps us out a lot as well. So if you haven't done that, do that too. Thanks again.